So we're delighted today to have uh, Jen Easterly with us. She is the Director of the Homeland Security Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. Uh, Ms. Easterly was nominated by President Biden in April 2021 and unanimously confirmed by the Senate on July 12, 2021. Ms. Easterly retired from the U.S. Army after more than 20 years of service. She was responsible for standing up the Army's first cyber battalion and also instrumental in the design and creation of the United States Cyber Command. She has worked within the intelligence community under two separate administrations and was most recently the head of Firm Resilience and Fusion Resilience Center at Morgan Stanley. Since the establishment of CISA, we've worked closely together and we appreciate Ms. Easterly's willingness to speak to us today. Please welcome Jen Easterly. Awesome. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Michelle and Amy. Nice to see you again. Uh, look, uh, good afternoon from the great state of Virginia on the East Coast. Uh, thanks, everybody, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, as Michelle noted, I've been leading CISA for a short period of time, uh, just about one month, but I am super excited to have an opportunity to spend some time with all of you, given the incredible importance of this issue and the amazing work that all of you do. Uh, I really see you as some of our most important stakeholders and partners, so I really look forward to spending more time with you uh, and an opportunity, hopefully sooner rather than later, to meet uh, in person. So let me just start off by saying that CISA, this department, this administration, as I hope you all appreciate, are absolutely committed to ensuring that election security remains a top priority. And we are focused on ensuring that you have the tools and the resources and the information you all need to ensure that our, our nation's elections are secure and are resilient. You and your colleagues did awesome work uh, in running and securing the 2020 elections. All of this accomplished in the face of a global pandemic with constantly changing election administration requirements, near constant misinformation, some harassment, and worse, frankly. So from the bottom of my heart, I just want to thank all of you for your work and your service uh, to our nation. I really am honored to join this partnership. I'm also thankful for the incredible work of my predecessor and close friend, Chris Krebs, uh, Matt Masterson, and many other CISA folk who've, who've worked so diligently to make this relationship what it is today. Uh, I have turned to them to uh, to better understand the nuances of this mission space, uh, as I will turn to all of you and look forward to learning from you and helping to empower and enable and support all of you. CISA's mission is very clear. Uh, as I've said, we're here to support you, the election officials, along with our private sector partners, consistent with the Constitution, uh, existing laws and electoral tradition to help you secure elections and to man manage the risk, whether it's cyber or physical or disinformation. Elections, as we all know, were run at the state and local level, and this is your domain. We stand in strong support. But we also know that the threat environment is very active and very complex, and the threats we all face today are nothing like uh, the threats election officials faced even five or 10 years ago. Uh, from those spreading uh, disinformation to an array of cyber threats like ransomware that we're all acutely aware of, uh, to threats of violence against election officials and workers, the landscape where you all operate is increasingly complex and difficult. And the rationale behind the 2017 designation of election infrastructure is critical infrastructure that state and local election officials should not be expected to combat sophisticated, dedicated, state-sponsored threat actors alone, I believe remains as true today as it did in the aftermath of 2016. I know that our partnership has come a long way since the designation, but I also think that we have room to grow, and I'm excited about that. CISA and the team before me, of course, have worked hard over the last five years to earn your trust, probably the most important word in our relationship is that trust and, and to make it what it is today. My goal is to continue to build on that foundation and work with you and the broader election community to help ensure that our nation's election infrastructure is secure and resilient against the myriad of threats facing you in the elections this year and heading into uh, both 2022 as well as 2024. CISA will continue to develop new tools and refine existing products we hope will make your jobs easier. Uh, our primary objective 
as I've been saying, is to support you, help you and your colleagues better understand that complex range of risks you face and assist you in prioritizing mitigation efforts. Your excuse me, your participation in this partnership with CISA is a really important element of that process. So uh, we really want to hear from you about how we can be most helpful in bringing to bear capabilities that will assist you. And I say that with complete uh, sincerity. We really need your feedback, continuous feedback to ensure that you all are getting the support and resources that you need to ensure the security and resilience of your elections. Incredibly important. We'll also continue to work closely with you to provide voluntary, no cost and confidential cyber and physical assessments. These include vulnerability scanning, the phishing assessments that we do, pen testing to help secure your networks, uh, and of course, physical security assessment assessments. As you probably know, we're able to deploy our hunt and incident response teams to your states to help get your networks restored in the event of a compromise. And we'll continue to strengthen collaborative efforts through these activities, such as election exercises. You know, it was pretty cool in my first, very first week on the job. Uh, CISA worked closely with many of you and your Secretary of State colleagues to host the fourth annual Tabletop the Vote. Uh, I was really impressed uh, with the event and the turnout. I think 45 states, DC, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands joined at least one of the three days along with over a thousand election officials and numerous private sector folks. That's an incredible achievement. And I know that we at CISA and our federal partners find tremendous value in these exercises as well. So, you know, with my first couple of days at the agency, I just found that so exciting and so energizing um, and why I think that this relationship and partnership is so critical to the fabric of our democracy as a nation and why I will put such a priority on it. You know, these opportunities also represent uh, uh, good opportunities for the federal government to really listen to those of you who administer and support elections so that we can understand how we can best assist you. This is a theme you're gonna hear from me over and over again, this continuous dialogue and feedback on relationship to ensure that you all get what you need to run safe and secure ele elections. And so whether that's performing assessments or training, sharing threat and vulnerability information, or of course, offering technical expertise and, and risk advice, that the exercise uh, as the one that I attended, I think are really a key component of developing the partnerships and of course, strengthening the resilience in the election uh, security community. I know that the team has already received some really helpful feedback from you all, and we'll, we'll of course continue to refine those tabletops. Uh, despite the difficult circumstances from the past year, I really believe that outstanding progress has been made. You all took advantage of both CISA and private sector uh, cyber and physical services. You signed up for security clearances. You joined us for threat briefings. You've helped us develop numerous tools and guidance documents. And you really, again, gave us that really critical feedback along the way. So thanks to your efforts, all this led to approximately 93% of ballots having an auditable record. You also made the election infrastructure ISAC the fastest growing ISAC in history. And that information wasn't just shared one way. You kept your colleagues and the federal government informed of the threats you saw at the state and local level. Uh, a major success of our partnership from the 2020 election was the speed with which this community was able to identify and report and attribute and share information with the public regarding Iranian and Russian activity last October. That would not have been possible without timely reporting by election officials who knew what to do with the information they had. All of this is strong evidence that the systems and the processes that we've collectively put in place since 2016 are indeed working. But look, if we've learned anything from the last election, it's that your networks continue to be a very attractive target for our adversaries, whether that's nation states or cyber criminals or some of other malicious actors. As highlighted in the reports that DHS released in March alongside our law enforcement and Intel community partners, sophisticated state-sponsored threat actors continue to conduct election-related influence operations and engage in cyber activity that, that can impact election infrastructure. It's clear that more and more nation states have really shown an interest in interfering our, in our election processes, particularly through the spread of misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. You know, I think this is one of the most 
uh, pernicious and scariest trends, quite, quite frankly, is this misinformation and disinformation. I say that as, a, as an American citizen, and I also say it as a mom. Uh, this is something that we're going to continue to work on and continue to focus on. It's incredibly important to ensure the American people have the facts that they need to have confidence in the integrity of our election infrastructure. We know that more works, work needs to be done to shore up our systems. And from my most recent review of CISA cybersecurity services, there is still a lot of work left to do for this sector to address vulnerabilities in their public facing systems. As we know, our adversaries are uh, sophisticated and dedicated. They target both large and small jurisdictions. Uh, exploiting vulnerabilities in an election jurisdiction, even a small office, allows them to undermine faith in a process that is inherently nationwide. So we're also seeing an increase in third parties us utilizing ransomware, targeting vulnerable systems to make a quick buck. And we've seen challenges from new and emboldening threat actors and additional challenges, as we're all acutely aware, uh, as the result of COVID-19. For example, we know election administration processes are are already not well understood by the public, creating that ripe environment for misinformation. So as a community, we need to continue to point at state and local election officials as the trusted sources for information. Incredibly important. You are the trusted voices out there and amplifying your voices is incredibly important to what we're all doing. Finally, as we've seen recently uh, in these really uh, horrific threats to election officials, including doxing. We are working very closely with our partners in the Department of Justice and the FBI to get a better handle on this threat. Uh, as the president has recently noted, our adversaries are already ramping up on the spread of misinformation ahead of the ahead of the midterm. So we're focusing on increasing public confidence in the integrity of the electoral system, combating misinformation and disinformation through new products and trainings. We also expect and are preparing for state and non-state actors to have high interest in these elections, uh, both next year and in 2024 and years to come. So we're gonna continue to build off our efforts from the last five years to harden our systems and secure elections from influence and from interference. Specifically, we need your help to reach to small and mid-sized election jurisdictions to ensure that they have awareness of the services and the resources that could improve their preparedness to the threats they may face. We remain committed to working with all of you to increase domain security, including the mitigation of threats of, from phishing, promoting the importance of leveraging the .gov top level domain uh, for building resilience. As, as I think this audience is well aware, .gov is a very important way an election office can establish its web presence in its jurisdiction. Uh, it's web present as sorry is the authoritative source for election related information in, in its jurisdiction. We've already had over 300 state, local, tribal and territorial governments sign up for the top level uh, domain for .gov since it's been offered at no cost this spring. And we really want to expand this number through the end of the year. Uh, in addition to our cyber services, please continue to leverage our protective security advisors who are located in your communities in 10 CISA regions around the countries. They provide physical assessments, guidance, and other resources. So over the upcoming years, you have my strong promise and commitment to work hard and continue to build and strengthen our partnership. But I'm gonna need your help along the way. I want to know what CISA can do to improve, what steps we can take to better support you. What is it that you need that you are not currently getting from CISA? Please provide us this feedback. Please continue to use our cyber and physical resources and provide also feedback on the ways we can assist you in securing this critical infrastructure. The purpose of our partnership is to continually build capacity to keep the machinery of democracy running in the face of current and future threats. So thank you very much for the warm welcome, uh, the steadfast commitment to our democratic principles over the years. Uh, I am really proud to be your colleague in this effort and look forward to getting to spend time with all of you and getting to know you better in the coming years. Uh, and with that, uh, I will now turn it over to my teammates who you are very familiar with, uh, Bob Kalaski and Jeff Hale. Thank you so much for the time. Amy, should we hop right in or? 
Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> Great. Um, it, well, it's, it's obviously, hi, hi everyone, Bob Kolaski. I run the National Risk Management Center, and I'm one of, as, as many of you know, I'm one of the assistant directors at CISA, and it's always uh, intimidating to follow your boss. Um, as, as Jen, Jen laid out her vision for for the functions, but um, but also it's great to have her aboard. And um, while being intimidating, it also makes my job a lot easier as we we segue into just a conversation more about um, what we're doing within CISA at, at the more operational and tactical level to support the overall election security effort. Um, as you heard for, from Director Easterly. Um, you know, w one of the things that uh, I think Jeff and I are most pleased at is uh, the clear leadership commitment that transcends administrations toward this mission. And, and Jeff and I, as career employees with, within the Department of Homeland Security, within CISA, have the job to make sure that, you know, just like a number of you do, right, that, that there are changes at the top of organizations along the way, but that the mission goes goes forward and, and we take advantage of the enthusiasm and, and the, the vision of, of new leaders, but um, we do that while executing against the core mission. And so, you know, I think it's probably um, a, a moment that, that, again, a number of you are familiar with, um, given, given the nature of being a state election director. Um, so, you know, we wanted to trans um, transfer a little bit of the agenda again, as I was saying, to talk a little more about um, kind of where we are operationally and, and then have a little bit of a dialogue to collect some of the feedback that, that Jen was just talking about. Um, so, you know, as, as starting doing that, um, I, I just want to reintroduce sort of my role in, in CISA's efforts. Uh, because I know we have a number of new state election directors. So my organization, the National Risk Management sent, um, hosts the election security initiative, which is about um, 20 or so employees of, of, of CISA who, you know, go to work every day thinking about uh, election security and providing support to state, local, uh, private sector um, around, but mainly state, local officials around securing elections, but working with the private sector. Um, so, so I have, uh, have the ability to sort of host the resources to do the work. And then I serve as uh, the department's uh, co-chair on the Government Coordinating Council and have since the inception of the Government Coordinating Council in 2017. And in that role, I, I work closely with Michelle um, now and have um, with, with former leaders from, from NASED, whether it be Lori, the, the past president, or Keith, and Judd, and, and Bob. And the good thing about the election community is all of, the, all of those folks are still here as state, state election directors. So, so while they're not um, serving as leaders of the Government Coordinating Council, they're still active within in the Coordinating Council community. And it's been a great partnership throughout. Um, and, and the Government Coordinating Council, I think, has proven to be an enduring structure that helps us unify the national effort to secure elections. Um, it is through the work of the Government Coordinating Council that we were able to surge national efforts to help provide security in the, the changing operational environment um, related to the pandemic last year. It is the, the good work of the Government Coordinating Council that really has set the conditions for much enhanced information sharing, putting in place information sharing protocols, communications protocols, so that we can address incidents, but also speak as much as possible with a unified um, voice as, as the election security and election administration um, communities as we talk about securing elections. And I think, you know, that, that became very important in 2020, when, you know, when we were able to say with some level of, of confidence that it was the most secure election we had ever seen and in, in, in that the, the country had ever seen in, in the face of what were real active threats from foreign adversaries. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the community stepped up um, with that security, and I think we were able to demonstrate that. And it helped us as, as um, collectively as we dealt with the information environment that, that Jen was just talking about it and, and gave, gave a voice to the technical folks who have the responsibility for securing elections so, so that we had a voice so, so that we could communicate all the steps that were taken to security and the confidence in the underlying security of, of elections, uh, you know, both at a national level and then, you know, th through all of you at the jurisdictional levels. So, so the Government Coordinating Council has borne a lot of fruit, and we will continue to work in that structure. Um, we've had an active year already and, and certainly look forward to, to doing as much as we can in between major national election cycles to elevate um, our overall efforts. 
um, our priorities this year as a coordinating council, and which, which I think merged nicely with, with, um, with what Jen was just talking about, continuing to improve information sharing, to, to um, continue to make sort of whatever we can do to influence operational tactical information sharing, um, uh, improvements working with the election infrastructure ISAC, the coordinating council helps guide the efforts of the election in, um, infrastructure information sharing analysis center, you know, which now has over 3,500 members and continues to go up. So continue to make improvements there. Uh, be, be a voice for ensuring that uh, support services that are being designed but by DHS, the Election Administration Commission, other nonprofits can be most useful in or nonprofits can be most useful in the hands of election officials. You know, we, we want to hear the federal resources that we're putting in that the money that's being appropriated by Congress is being out there in a way that, that you all can take advantage of it. You know, the thing we are most um, we have been most eager about this year has been the the um, getting more election um, jurisdictions, particularly locals under the .gov domains. I think the ability to do that at a no cost price has been largely through the work that, that we've taken on through through what we've been appropriated in hearing from the coordinating council and, and some practices that, that were put in place. So, so that's been a big push. Jeff can talk a little more about that. Um, other things we're working on as coordinating council is, is really, again, uh, tacking off what Jen was just saying, um, you know, efforts around physical security and ensuring that that the risks, that the increased risks that we're, we're seeing in this space uh, of, of toward violence um, are accounted for in the overall risk profile that that um, whatever voice we can use to um, to communicate both at the federal level and then at the state and local jurisdictional level that that election infrastructure, election officials, um, other other aspects related to election administration are um, unfortunately being um, you know more likely to be t targeted or at least it seemed to be at a period where there's heightened attention about what's going on with elections and, and that may elevate a little bit of the level of physical risk and we want to make sure that that does not get lost um, amongst law enforcement priorities and we want to help navigate those of you who who find yourself in, in in a different space in terms of perhaps concern with aspects of physical risk help, help navigate the process and, and we're working through that um a couple other areas of, of focus for the coordinating council in, in in the overall effort again advancing in sort of institutionalizing some of our efforts to get the truth out in the face of the mis dis and malinformation environment um, really understand that uh, you know some of the narratives that are out there are, are, are intended to undermine the confidence that the American voter has in the electoral processes. And uh, those of you out there who are running these electoral processes know that that a lot of this is just frankly untrue. And we want to help amplify that message, help get the right spokespeople out there, the trusted voices, get the right information, and, and, and then amplify it in the face of, of these emerging narratives and do it in a way that respects the, the, the bipartisan and, and to some level nonpartisan aspects of the work of election administrators. Um, and then finally, you know, the other thing that's always top of mind for DHS is to try to um, serve as a way to shepherd the integrated um, federal support to to government officials, particularly as it comes to the, the national security agencies, whether it be the FBI, whether it be the intelligence community, um, work we're doing internationally, make, make sure that that, um, that reflects kind of what we understand um, to, to be the state of election administration and is designed to support election administrators. You know, stick to the mantra that I like to use always when I when I talk to groups of election officials is again, we are there in support. The federal government is helping fill the fill the gap in the face of not real national security challenges, but we want to do it on top of the good work of, of state election officials around the country, of, of ele other election administrators around the country. And so so that's where we will continue to drive. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, who, who runs the election security initiative on, on a day to day basis to walk you through some particulars along those lines. And then we'll take some questions. Jeff. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank you to uh, Director Easterly uh, for those opening comments. Um, reiterating uh, a, a lot of the commitment to, um, uh, to this mission, I want to thank you all as partners. Um, I learn so much from you every time that, that we're able to get together. Uh, I look forward to these conferences and the opportunity to 
um, understand how to better serve you all as the election community um, and as the senior officials in, in charge of um, how best to secure the uh, the infrastructure and ensure the integrity uh, of our elections. Um, I like to bring a lot of the uh, best practices that we learned from support to other sectors. Um, one of these is a recent product that's uh, on chain of custody that CISA issued. I think this complements the work of the Election Assistance Commission on chain of custody guidance. But I think that one of the uh, uh, the important factors that, that uh, um, it, it, is important to, to ensure resonates across. The chain of custody is important whether we're talking about pacemakers or voting systems. Uh, and so it wasn't just an issue for uh, the election security uh, of, of the nation and recent events around there. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the practices on, that were uh, promoted across different critical infrastructure se uh, sectors on the tracking and control of data and assets uh, to enable you all uh, to ensure the transparency, accountability, and trust of your systems. Um, so um, CISA released the Chain of Custody Guidance Insights product. If you are not re receiving those, um, please let us know. We want to ensure that you are uh, in our information sh sharing uh, environment. Um, this highlights where uh, broken and loss of chain of custody uh, pro produce, provide risk uh, on both the integrity uh, of the system and whether the data is trustworthy, whether it can be used for the purposes of uh, court cases and, and lawsuits, and whether you feel comfortable uh, reuse of systems or reintegrating um, lost and, and received uh, systems and assets back into your environment. Um, vastly oversimplifying what chain of custody is to us, which is slightly different than, than how a Department of Justice partner uh, would describe it, um, is really taking the uh, cybersecurity framework uh, and, and applying that as a risk management um, practice for understanding what assets you care about, who has the ability to control uh, and, uh, and produce change on those systems, uh, what you are doing to restrict access and the concept of uh, least common privilege, uh, how are you preventing those uh, other actors from um, accessing, um, making changes, making unauthorized changes, what is uh, the methods and systems that you build trust into your processes and procedures. I'm, I'm very thankful, um, I think back to when I was first exposed to the election community and learned from individuals like yourself, like uh, uh, Bob Giles and uh, Lori were able to teach me a lot of the physical security safeguards that go into protecting ballots, go into protecting voting systems. Uh, and this is the evidence-based chain of custody uh, that we think uh, is relevant both to the election sector, election infrastructure sector, uh, but also a, an issue uh, across critical infrastructure. Uh, most importantly, it's how do you detect when something happened uh, and is there enough evidence to know what happened and how to recover from it? And if there is not, uh, that really determines how you will respond, uh, how you'll prevent further consequences, and what you do next in, in the environment. Uh, again, this is common across uh, many critical infrastructure sectors, uh, and uh, the ability to prevent unauthorized access to those systems uh, that might jeopardize the confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, and allow you to trust of the systems that you operate on. So hopefully you all are in seat of the chain of custody guidance. We are happy to take feedback uh, for both whether this sector needs, um, would like additional information, uh, additional tailored guidance. This really, this is a, uh, a dialogue to understand as the director said, how we can be most helpful. Uh, so if there's this generalized um, critical infrastructure guidance, uh, do we want to further election specific information uh, on chain of custody or other security topics. Um, similarly, in the line of trust that both uh, Director Easterly and Bob mentioned, um, we believe that it should be easy for the public to know that they're engaged with a government agency. Now, this is one of the, the ways to reduce the effectiveness of spoofed websites, proxy websites, of spoofed domains, uh, and to uh, 
make some of the security practices um, secure by default as you move your counties to the to the uh, a.gov top level domain. Um, what's important here is that many of you at the at state level are already on .gov, but we need help reaching your local jurisdictions. Um, this was made no cost to incentivize uh, and make it easier uh, for particularly small and medium sized lo uh, local jurisdictions, uh, counties to be able to move to the .gov. Um, this prevents the .orgs and, and .coms being as effective uh, at, at basically falsifying or spreading mis and disinformation about uh, elections in your state um, if, if the public knows to go to a .gov. Um, we have also updated and released new material uh, specific to elections because we understand that your governance uh, is often different than, the, than other aspects of state and local government uh, and that you will have different authorizers uh, for uh, for who should be able to approve uh, a request for a .gov website. So uh, please take a look at the, uh, the new election specific page on our .gov website. That's dotgov.gov about elections. Uh, continuing with the theme of how can we support you to rebuild trust uh, across the uh, election community, uh, much of security is uh, is really about uh, re assuring those trust environments. So uh, please continue to take us up on cybersecurity services. Uh, one of the uh, for for many of you who already do uh, this may be tailored to the new folks. Um, cyber uh, cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency CISA uh, provides no cost voluntary cybersecurity services, including vulnerability scanning, remote penetration testing phishing campaign assessments, and then uh, resources more tailored for your private sector partners, like our critical product evaluation, where you take one system and asset and really just break it down in open-ended vulnerability testing as much as possible. All of this information feeds back to our understanding of risk, but also is provided directly to you uh, to uh, allow you to make informed decisions of where to prioritize uh, resources on risk efforts uh, make informed requests for resources uh, about uh, being able to, to describe the security posture and which uh, what a next tranche of resources may be used to secure the, uh, the next election, uh, and to uh, be able to improve the landscape as a, as a whole uh, as we understand the types of threats uh, that occur across uh, across the election infrastructure. Um, we also provide tailored training, uh, training to the uh, election sector uh, that focuses particularly on ransomware, which is plaguing state and local governments, uh, phishing as a primary method for distribution of ransomware and malware, and then building, secure, building trust through secure practices. Uh, that last training, we've been very happy with the, uh, with the states who have requested it. You can contact my team uh, to request any of these trainings. We, we could, we'll do them either remotely or on site, uh, but that is uh, really about uh, the operational best practices uh, and how to speak to those in order to uh, provide the transparency to the public of how you have secured the election. Sometimes it's not just about um, taking the secure practices, it's how you uh, explain to the public those steps that you've taken. Many of you are already pros at this. Uh, this is uh, often uh, a good opportunity to standardize across your uh, your locals how to best speak to them with a unified voice. Both Bob and the director spoke to uh, the importance of physical security and understanding the, the threats that you all are receiving. I also want to highlight um, the, the CISA resources of protective security advisors. Uh, many of you are already very well tied in for those who are our new CISA has field staff uh, located in your states, in your jurisdictions, uh, able to both serve to facilitate access to all of our, cyber, our, our physical and cybersecurity resources, to conduct assessments, uh, to ensure that you have the information you need, uh, and to um, liaise 
uh, back to the federal government and the entire resources of the federal government on election security. Um, many states, uh, this has been uneven, but many states have taken advantage of uh, our physical security assessments and assessed every storage location for voting systems at every election offices, and we would like to promote that type of activity because with that uh, assessment, uh, we're able to both advocate for a uh, for the next step in physical security um, re and resilience, uh, but also to promote uh, additional practices and release guidance with the the trends analysis that we see um, uh, around physical security, uh, around how to protect your offices, how to protect your locals' offices. Uh, much of what we've seen is. Uh, inherent to you, but maybe not be clear to others across law enforcement or the public. Uh, your offices are, and your local's offices are highly accessible to the public. Um, they serve communities as they are supposed to. Uh, and this means that uh, they may have not been um, selected with all security practices in mind. So we want to highlight opportunities uh, for improvement across, uh, uh, across alarms, uh, locks, types of glass, uh, that are just best practices for other infrastructure sectors. Uh, we've also recognized the, uh, the nexus of both cyber and physical when it comes to doxing. And so we saw Iran take a very prominent attempt uh, at doxing election officials, federal officials, uh, and the private sector in this community. Um, <clears throat> both the former director and Bob uh, were among those on the uh, on the doxing list of, uh, of Iran's Enemy of the People site, uh, along with several of you, uh, we have issued guidance on mit mitigating the impacts of doxing on critical infrastructure. Uh, the intent there is that uh, there are several practices where you can improve your ability to identify and detect uh, when, certainly not just when being doxed, but how those, that information can be leveraged against you uh, to compromise your social media accounts, your bank accounts, and what steps you have to put in place uh, to better uh, secure your, system, your systems, networks, and accounts against uh, additional compromise and exploitation. Lastly, in, um, in the theme of this, uh, recognizing that you all are facing unprecedented uh, threats and security, there is a very coordinated federal support effort. Um, I want to both reinforce what you'll hear um, from all federal agencies that said uh, reporting immediate threats to local law enforcement is key for your for safety, but there's a combined federal effort to um, to understand and a recognition that the that we did not see the full landscape of the threats you all and your locals were facing. Uh, and in recognition of that, there's a, a combined effort to better understand uh, the where reporting lands. Uh, to receive it directly through the FBI, and that anything that you provide to us, well, uh, well, you should not think of CISA first as, uh, as protecting your, uh, your safety in a threatening environment, but anything that is reported to us, we will share with the appropriate federal, uh, federal partners, the DOJ, FBI, the intelligence community, when you all reported um, the, the activity, the Iranian activity in advance of the election, uh, we can serve as that liaison uh, to improve the information environment. With that, uh, I do want to open up for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff and Bob. Um, as a reminder, um, NASA members, you can either uh, put a question in the chat uh, or raise your hand or respectfully unmute and not talk all over each other. Um, I did get uh, one question to start us off. Let me pull it up. Um, how does CISA see itself helping election officials overcome the noise and misinformation besides the trusted or beyond the trusted voices idea? Um, it seems like we should be more proactive and less reactive to reclaim the conversation. Um, is this something that CISA can help with or are you primarily in a reactive position? So Jeff, you want me to start and then, um, so a couple things, Amy, and, and this is this is the kind of area where uh, some dialogue would be good, whether we could do it here or sort of as a follow-up. One is is obviously we would like to be more than just reactive. 
Um, so, so we are working to improve our sensing of, of narratives that are emerging, which is still a little bit reactive, but it, it does. Um, we want to have the ability to get in front of things before before necessarily we we, we think we want to um, address them. So flow on, and you know, one of the things with rumor control that that we did post rumor control is we've established more of a process and then more of a, a, a team to get better sense. We're making some investments in, in analytics. Um, but, you know, the more we hear from the NASAD community about narratives that are potentially concerning earlier, we can anticipate um, whether we want to address them as they get closer to be th being things that, that we want to actively address. Um, and then, you know, the other area that, that you know, we, we are continuing to put focus on is resilience related messaging and ways to think about better prepping the information environment so that people are less susceptible to um, false information. This is um, obviously hugely difficult right now in, in the existing information environment as we're seeing around things like like public health interventions and things like that. Um, so we, we have um, made more investments in trying to understand um, some, some of the science on why certain narratives are, are going to um, people are going to be are, are going to resonate with folks what it would mean to better um, better prepare people to be more resilient in, in the face of those sorts of narratives are there ways through um, targeted preliminary messaging about awareness ed education opportunities things that, that feel more like civics to, to sort of uh, better better you know, make it less likely that, that things are going to land. And we certainly see a role in that, you know, at the existing resource levels we've had, this is, this is, we're, we're doing this work a lot in partnership with non-governmental organizations, relying on, on trusted communities, not just the election officials as tr trusted voices, but other places where people get, get accurate information in sort of things that people are believing related to that. And th then we're trying to do um, campaigns like like we just recently did put out a graphic novel uh, uh, around the misinformation around 5G and, and, and the association with negative health effects with with 5G um, in a, in a way that will resonate with with different different communities and, and also hopefully you know hit some influencers so, so we can go viral with with the idea that that the truth is cool again right and, and you know how do we figure out ways to, to go viral with with that message and, and you know we'll, we'll keep working for that area and, and learn what what is having impact and, and what does seem to be resonating on the positive message side jeff completely agree that uh, we do want to be proactive and not reactive um I think there's a lot of factors here. Bob mentioned some of the risk education. So how do you increase awareness of the risks of mis and disinformation uh, and how it is a, a vector that can induce compromise? Um, so we have done things like, you all remember the war on pineapple campaign to start to introduce uh, people to, um, to how mis and disinformation can be brought into real world consequences. Uh, Bob mentioned the uh, graphic novels uh, that we've produced two in our resilience series. Uh, we also helped to fund an online game called Breaking Harmony Square. Uh, all of these are kind of the proactive risk education side of the, uh, of the house. Uh, we also think there's an opportunity. A lot of the mis and disinformation narratives that we see uh, seem to be almost a game of Mad Libs or a rehash of, uh, of old narratives. So we're looking to learn what we can uh, about this and help you all as the trusted sources of information, trusted points of information in your states, um, advance uh, uh, the, the true and, uh, and expose people to the truth before those narratives can even take off. Um, it is less effective to be reactive, but exposure to the truth matters here. So uh, we're happy to learn and continue to support you as best we can here. And we're open to, to new ideas. Thank you. I know, uh, Megan Wolf, uh, you had a question. Great. Thank you. And thank you both for being here. You know, I think always having these conversations is just such a strong show of our continued partnership. So we really appreciate you being here and being willing to take some of our questions. Um, so I have two questions for you. Uh, the first is that, you know, there was a lot of uh, conversation around 
listening and learning from election officials about how we can best how you can be best useful or how we can best partner together as we take on the challenges of the year ahead of us. Um, one of the things that I think continues to be sort of a persistent challenge for us is how do we reach those small jurisdictions? Um, we know from the last EVES data that more than 60% of our local jurisdictions, our election jurisdictions, are under 10,000 in population. And so I still think we have a very underserved population of local election jurisdictions. And what is your plan to engage specifically with those small jurisdictions to make sure that we are creating services uh, that are able to meet their needs? That's my first question. And then the second one is, um, do you have any plans to partner with states on the .gov domain? Uh, and my thought is that if you're able to partner with states, we'd able be able to tap into those subdomains for the state-specific .gov, so .wi.gov and so forth. Um, and I think that adds an either, even further layer of protection um, through our state systems as well. Uh, we're finding that we think it's you know incredible that we have access to .gov, but we'd really like our locals to be on .wi.gov. Um, and if there was some coordinated effort underway, I think that would be really useful to a lot of us. So thank you very much. So, so Jim, thank you, Megan. I'll take the yeah. I could take the latter part first. Um, so we manage the top level domain .gov uh, when it has a state based um, subdomain there, like uh, .wi. It is run. It is then managed by your state level. We are happy to support uh, and awareness and connect uh, with all the appropriate um, leads and points of contact that we have. Uh, across there, it is less of an active management by CISA in that uh, in that circumstance. Um, totally agree that the uh, to your first point about the need to reach small and mid-sized jurisdictions that is our priority. Uh, what we have learned over time is that uh, the best way to do that in, is to go through yourselves, to go through state associations, uh, to to learn um, how elections are governed and operated in each state uniquely. Uh, for example, um, in, term, in some states we've found that there's more active control over their systems and networks uh, by the election officials, whereas in some that may have township models, uh, there's less uh, IT control. Uh, so they're less likely to, uh, to take us up on cybersecurity services. We do believe we have a, found, uh, a series of foundational services that are uh, appropriate and important uh, for election officials. Um, things like our vulnerability scanning, things like our, our remote penetration testing allow and give election officials, even local election officials in, in small jurisdictions, the information set uh, to go back to counties, to go back to their IT managers, uh, to go back to their legislature uh, in, with requests for resources to, to address those critical needs. Uh, do understand that there's security fatigue. I can imagine you guys have had me and us talking at you for five years now. Uh, you guys have been tremendous partners in this. Uh, I imagine the locals feel the same way. So we are absolutely open to other opportunities to, to speak to them, other approaches, uh, and anything that uh, that we can use to, um, to better incentivize risk management practices across the community. Yeah, the, the only thing I would say, Megan, on top of, of what Jeff just said is, you know, putting more resources out there will help achieve that. I, I think Jeff and I are both a little bit humble in our ability from Washington to figure out everything that's going to work with every um, local election official. And uh, along the lines of what Jeff's saying, you know, more and more get closer to the local level states and hear that. So, so you know, CISA, as you know, or I think you know, is, is working to hire 50 state cyber advisors on top of our existing advisory core. Some of those have already already been hired and you know, folks who work at a state capitals who are intended to, to push our message down the local level um, saw that the Senate just passed the infrastructure bill today. That infrastructure bill has about a billion dollars in, in cyber grants that would be designed to help state and local election officials. It still obviously has to go through through the House of Representatives, but that would put more resources and then programs like the Cyber Navigator program, which, which I think is on your agenda later today, um, will hopefully help those resources get directed effectively. 
you know, part of part of our strategy is also to treat this as election infrastructure as part of the overall need to help state and local governments enhance their cybersecurity. And that includes, you know, trying to build relationships with particularly managed service providers where local jurisdictions may provide, um, may rely on for some of their, their underlying IT infrastructure and think about ways to help put more money out there to improve IT infrastructure overall, which helps address some of the security fatigue that Jeff was talking about. If you, if you modernize your IT, you're, you're likely starting at a better security point. Um, we have a question from Karen Brinson Bell in North Carolina. Thanks, Amy. Um, both a question and a comment. I'll start with the comment and say that um, we are very appreciative of the training um, sessions that have been made available through CISA. Uh, we actually have one scheduled again tomorrow um, in, in the four part series and now a new version um, where Ryan Macias and Noah Pretz will um, be you know, conducting a workshop for all 100 counties virtually. And um, while we still have to take it to a very granular level and adapt plans and so forth for each of the counties and work with our, our local and state emergency management partners, um, we have found those trainings to be very helpful. And just if nothing else, but building that partnership, um, the same with our PSAs going out and doing on-site physical security assessments, um, that has been tremendously helpful. And we were able to apply HABA funds for security grants um, because of some of those assessments. So for that, thank you. And then I also want to say thank you to Jeff in particular for taking my call and then being uh, quick to respond um, when we were faced with uh, the request to have um, our voting equipment opened and inspected. And I knew that this was not the path we wanted to go down. I knew that because of our critical infrastructure designation and the criticalness of our voting equipment, uh, that I needed to be able to, you know, emphatically state that that was not going to happen. Um, we've still received some pushback from the legislators that are interested in doing that, but the response that you provided, Jeff, um, about our our, you know, being a critical infrastructure uh, sector um, agency and operations really helped to um, reinforce that. And having that was just really, um, you know, not to use the word critical again, but it did prove to be critical. Uh, so thank you. And to that, my comment would be, what can we do or how can we ensure that that kind of response is available um, in general? Because it's one thing for me to get that response or for Arizona when they had a need, but really it's a message that applies to all of us and um, and we need to be united in that front, I feel like. Um, and CISA is where we could get that help or that message across. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, go ahead, Bob. I, I, was, I was simply gonna say, um, you know, first of all, I'll let Jeff uh, Jeff acknowledge um, his good work, but but you know we're lucky to have Jeff on our team, and um, you know one of our goals is to be responsive to any individual requests. But but we would like to put guidance out there that we can point to around good security practices. The, the chain of custody guidance was, was 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 something along those lines, so that that you know there's already authoritative security guidance as much as possible around issues that may arise, and then we can. Also be responsive, but but you know to, to the point. We 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 rather not weigh in in every particular debate between state legislatures and states and you know executive and legislative branches, as as much as make sure we have guidance that that you as a, as the, the technical leader responsible for uh, secure elections can point to that this is how elections are made secure and do that and you know that again that that's all part of this feedback loop to, to try to be anticipatory of areas where. Good security guidance will will help reinforce message um, to, to voters and, and, and political leaders. Absolutely. Uh, um, those of you that know me know that I have never been in your seat. I have never administrate administered an election. Uh, my background is in security uh, and critical infrastructure security. So when I hear from you all, uh, I do not. Um, pretend to, to know exactly everything that you're going through, uh, but I look for uh, sinews across other critical infrastructure sectors to uh, that would be useful. 
Um, and so that's where we think that CISA can really add value. We have we sit at an excess of a lot of critical infrastructure sectors uh, and have the ability to reach back into those communities um, to apply best practices here. When I hear from more than one of you on a particular topic, I view that as a common requirement. And so we look to address those um, uh, in guidance documents. Uh, oftentimes that guidance exists for another critical infrastructure sector and it just uh, involves a little bit of tailoring. Sometimes um, we'll make it our, ourselves to, to meet the needs of this community. Uh, but the key factor here is, um, can I hear from you either through our uh, our field staff, uh, through uh, our local um, CISA employees um, conveying your message or directly, uh, and then understanding how we can add value. Uh, the other thing to the training, please invite us. We, If you guys send us uh, an invitation uh, to any of your conferences, we will tailor uh, our trainings to whatever time slot you can fit for us. Uh, we have um, four hour to 90 minute trainings so that we can do them uh, shorter, we can we can give you just the highlights, uh, but I think that it's important to, to uh, be able to um, show our commitment to not only you all, uh, to this partnership, but to your locals, uh, that uh, when you invite us, we will make sure that we can get somebody there to give you full support and broaden awareness of the security resources we have available. Thank you, Bob and Jeff. Um, do we have other uh, questions or comments from the NASDAQ audience? You don't have to raise your little hand. You can just unmute and ask. Jeff, Bob, do you have any Amy, have uh, a, a, closing remarks? Oh, Amy, I go have ahead. a question. This is Tracy from New Mexico. Go How ahead. states handling IPRA requests when it comes to um, penetration tests and other IT security. I, I, are you guys going into protected critical information? Do I, we're getting a lot of IPRA requests. I, I don't know how to handle them or the best way. So the audio cut out a little bit, uh, so please correct me if uh, if I, I misheard, but uh, I believe it was how do we handle the information derived from the uh, assessments. So if you request a, uh, for example, a remote penetration test, um, all of the terms of how we will handle and protect that information are uh, laid out in the request for technical assistance that's signed by both parties, yourselves, and ourselves, um, it can, under some circumstances, those are protected critical infrastructure information that protects it at the federal level. Um, we don't pretend to have a full awareness of all state sunshine laws. Uh, and so we'd rely on you all and your council uh, to understand uh, what the applicable statutes are uh, for whether that information is available through um, uh, through those type of uh, vehicles. Um, we do think that security information is is appropriately uh, protected uh, and, and should be conveyed in a manner that helps you take security practices uh, and uh, implement your security controls rapidly, candidly, uh, and, and make those changes uh, as, as quickly as possible so that uh, you're in a better protected state, um, of course, much of this is subject to the statutes in your jurisdiction. Thank you. Anyone else? Bob, Jeff, any closing remarks? My only closing remarks is again just to thank um, thank all of you for the work you're doing, and to NASA as an organization. Amy a Amy has your uh, intrepid presence in Washington for for your active partnership with us, and um, you know one of the reasons that we feel like we we hear from uh, state election officials regularly is we hear from Amy regularly, and and she's advocating you know for frequently on, or she's advocating on your behalf and she's unafraid to do so. 
um, whenever it needs to be done. So, so appreciate that, Amy. Um, no, appreciate all of you and NASA that the, the you know the the good work you're doing in the partnership. And again, I, I hope you heard from us. You know, Jeff and I have now done you know a lot of NASA conferences. I, I hope you hear both um, continuation in terms of the commitment to support you, but but hopefully you, you know the team is particularly getting smarter about um, the best ways to support you, and that we are um, we are responding to the feedback we're getting, and we will continue to be there as active partners with with the state election community and with the state election directors, and we're putting more effort into that. And um, hopefully we're getting better. Um, and if we aren't, we won't, we want to hear about it. But but we'll keep going. And you know, again, I'm thrilled that, that um, Director Easterly is here, and she's got her eye on this ball. And, and we will continue to do what we can to bring bring to bear federal support to, to your important work. Bob, that was such a diplomatic way to say I'm a really big pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, I do a lot of these babies, but the best kind. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for your time. Wish you have a, a wonderful conference.